cheap piece of crap relay. Take that. Well, well, well. What have we got here today? Today we're going to take another look at my inductively heated solder pot. Why would I want an inductively heated solder pot? I want it to get hot quickly. If I've only got a couple of coaxes to make to make up a couple jumpers or a couple of uh, SO2 or PL259s to put on the cable, I want to be able to get in, get the job done, get it over with. I don't want to wait around for 20 minutes for my solder pot to heat up. Besides, this was a fun project. And this thing here will take this slug of solder, and this is about 4.7 ounces or 133 grams of solder. It's an inch and 5 sixteenths in diameter. It's an inch tall. Uh, that's 33 by 24 millimeters for you metric types. And it will take it to the molten state in about 30 seconds. It'll melt all around the edges and in about another 15 seconds the whole thing is totally molten. So about 45 seconds it's up and ready to rock and roll. Works out pretty well. I've taken some crucibles that I got online. I found these on eBay. And I mounted a thermocouple on the bottom of it with some capped on tape. I put a layer of heavy boat uh, fiberglass mat, another layer of capped on tape, another layer of fiberglass, another layer of capped on tape. I ended up with four layers of fiberglass. And this is just regular fiberglass. We're only running at about 180 C and it'll handle that fairly well. The capped on tape is good for 260 degrees centigrade which is about 500 degrees Fahrenheit so I'm not worried about the capped on tape coming off. So my slug of solder fits right down inside there and I want to break the porcelain crucible here. Fits right up inside the coil. This is all kind of a lash together. This is just I'm working out the control system and we're going to get this thing up and running. I've got a controller here and in fact if I plug this thing in we can turn the controller on and as you can see this is about $23 on eBay, $23, $24 delivered. I went with the one that's controlled or uh, driven by 120 volts AC Actually, it will operate from 90 to 260. They're also available in the 24 volt version. We've added a fan on the top, and it turns out that once you've water cooled the coil, the next thing that starts to get hot are the chokes. They get pretty darn warm to the point it was under continuous duty. It was a little bit worrisome. Then later on, the capacitors start to get warm. This is a 230 volt fan running on 120 volts AC, so it's virtually silent, but it's moving plenty of air. I'm using this pump, and it said Beckett. I bought this at the homeless desk spot. I figured Beckett can't be a bad pump. Well, let me tell you, this thing is a POS, total POS, absolute trash. And I would have taken it back and shoved it up someone's rear end, but I needed something to circulate water to get this project going. This thing claims 80 gallons an hour. And I'll tell you what, I can literally piss faster than this thing can pump. But it does move enough water that the coil stays reasonably cool. Actually, it stays quite cool. It keeps it perfectly, perfectly cold. They claim it'll pump two and a half feet by the time you get to a foot and a half, it's barely dribbling out the end of the hose. The only way I could get this thing to pump was I had to take the bucket that's down here. You can see that orange bucket under the bench. The, it would only pump the water to about here and stop. So I had to pick the bunk, bucket up to the same level as the table. And once it started pumping, of course, now there's water going downhill to counterbalance the weight of the water. It has to pump uphill. And once that's done, it will pump continuously. Break the vacuum or break the seal and let air in there and you're done. But as long as there's water in both tubes, it'll carry it up here to the table. I've got a solid state relay over here uh, buffering the output of this. The pamphlet that comes with the timer claims it will handle 5 amps on the contacts. The American reseller, U.S. reseller that I bought this from, 
states it'll handle 3 amps. And I know from experience working uh, with these in the industry for many years, you don't really want to count on these handling any current. We always buffered ours through a solid state relay. That way you're only switching somewhere around 15 milliamp ears at, you know, anywhere from 3 to 30 volts to operate the SSR. That in turn will operate this relay. I've got both contacts paralleled here to handle the uh, DC current. Uh, this is rated at 10, amp on, 10 amps on each contact with them parallel. It should handle the 12 or 13 amps that this thing's drawing quite easily. You can get SSRs that will switch DC. I didn't have one. I wasn't about to buy one. I have about 10 of these in my junk box. So I went with, you know, I run what I brung. Let's put it that way. Last time you saw this, I had a great big analog power supply. These are 48 volt nominal. You can tweak them all the way up to 50 volts at 25 amps. I've got two of these. And these are designed to run up to three of them in parallel. If you run these jumpers between the units, it equalizes the current. I tried for two seasons to sell these at the ham flea market. Two, uh, one in the spring, one in the fall. Two cycles of that. So four times I had these for sale. $30 each or $50 for the pair, which is an absolute bargain. These are hundreds of dollars new. Nobody would buy them. You get a lot of appliance operators look at them and go, Will that work with my XYZ transceiver? And I'd say, well, where's it made? And they'd say, well, it's made in Japan. i say, oh, you can't use this. This is Canadian. It uses Canadian electrons. You'll blow something up. And they wander away. Obviously, they weren't going to buy it anyway. The other night, I'm laying in bed, and I realized these are still up in the barn. I don't need that great big huge analog power supply I've got. This will give me 48 volts, which is the nominal voltage for the induction heater. More than handle the current, and at a tenth the weight. Although I did have to modify this. It's got two fans in the back, and it sounded like an F-111 on uh, full afterburner trying to take off. So I put the fans in series, and it cut the noise level down considerably. Although now it does have an alarm flashing because it, <laughs> it doesn't see both fans connected. But that's all right. I don't care. The unit still works. It stays ice cold with half-speed fans. It doesn't even get warm. Why they put such noisy fans and stuff, I'll never understand. Let's see here. Uh, we've talked about the pump. We've talked about the amount of solder that's in here how I insulated the cup and mounted the thermocouple. And I had a bunch of thermocouples. By the way, you can buy these with or without thermocouples. They're a little bit more money if they're supplied with the thermocouple. But I had no need of it. I've got a box of thermocouples left over from having them in my travel bag for years. So I was all set. Originally I had used this relay which is a nice mega heavy duty unit. Plus it had the added advantage that I could turbo boost this thing by just pushing the contacts closed. But the armature on this buzzed so loudly it would drive you out of the room and I just couldn't put up with it. So I changed over to that little din rail mount unit over there and it's virtually silent. So now I have a little turbo boost button. Why a turbo boost button? I have this regulated at 180 degrees C, and this is off about 2.5 or 3 degrees. I haven't bothered to calibrate it. When it's reading 180, it's actually, on the, on the red scale here, it's actually about 185. The melting point of the solder is 183. By keeping it at the low temperature, it's molten and ready for use. But it, you don't get a lot of oxidation. It uh, lowers the amount or it decreases the amount of oxidation if you keep the temperature low. When it comes time to actually solder, I hit the little turbo boost button here and bring it up to about 200 C. That's going to give me, uh, well, that'll allow me, let's put it this way, it'll allow me less time in the solder pot with my coax. I can go in, it'll wet the braid very quickly, I can get out before the center conductor or the center insulator starts to melt. 
Sounds counterintuitive, but sometimes you're better off with a little more heat so you can get in, get the joint done, and get out rather than sit there at 180 degrees waiting for the braid to get hot enough to wick up the solder. Meanwhile, your center conductor is melting, or your center insulator, I should say, is melting. So let me move the camera, and I'll show you how quickly this thing makes everything molten. One more thing before we get going here. If you watched my previous video, we spoke about how you have to be careful with these inductive heaters, bringing them up to make sure that the power is up before you uh, turn on the inductive heater so that you don't lock up the transistors and burn them up. And sure enough, you can listen to how long it takes for this power supply to go active after the power is turned on. There's about a half a second delay there before this thing wakes up entirely. So I'm going to shut it down. It'll take a while for the caps to bleed down. And if you think that's noisy, you should have heard it before I put the fans in parallel. Now the beauty is, now that the power's off, I am going to power this guy up. When these come on, I'm going to engage it now, and it's going to go through a self-test routine. Listen for the relay. Okay, so that took almost a full second. What that means is I can put everything on one big master switch, and while my heater controller is going through its self-check routine, this will have plenty of time to come up and turn on. Right now everything's plugged in separately because I'm working out the control system. But that was nice to see that it has a, at least a full second self-check routine before it engages the relay to turn on the heater. So I can safely use a single switch. I don't have to worry about sequencing anything. It will take care of it all by itself. Now we'll move the camera over to the pot. Okay, we're just about ready to rock and roll here. I'm going to engage the power or turn on the power to the heat control. And when we hear the relay click in, I'll start the stopwatch. Because when the relay clicks in, that's when this coil is going to be energized. So the timer is, or the power is turned on. And we'll start the stopwatch as soon as the relay pulls in. There it goes. And we'll see how long it takes for this to go molten. And I'm glad to see the camera's not affected by the RF. There's 10 seconds. I'm seeing little bubbles on the edges already. There it is, 16. It's beginning to turn molten around the edges. I hope you can see that. 23 seconds, and it's getting ready to start to collapse back down into the pot. And by the time we get to about 45 seconds, we should just about be fully molten here which is pretty incredible. 40, 43. <laughs> and my relay just cooked. So I'm going to have to go back to the heavier relay, it looks like. But about 45 seconds, the pot was good and molten. Unfortunately, that relay that was supposedly rated for 10 amps per contact didn't handle the current. I'm going to switch the relay and we'll come back. Okay, here's what happens when you don't account for the fact you're running DC instead of AC across the contacts. You have to derate relay contacts at DC. Obviously a lot more than I had done in my head because these were supposed to be 10 amps a piece, 20 amps total, and I hope you can see that those are just totally melted. The silver has completely fused across all three sections. So that's history. So I've gone back to this old beast. The only problem with that, it works perfectly fine, it's just noisy as hell. Somewhere in my junk, I know I have another large contactor that will easily handle the current. I just can't put my hands on it at the moment, and I haven't done a concentrated search. It's in a drawer, or it might be up in the barn with my flea market stuff, I'm not sure. But let's uh, turn the power supply back on. And that should come up, and we'll turn the controller on. And of course, it's already partially at temperature here. Oh, I gotta plug this back in. I unplugged everything so I didn't get toasted. There we go. 
we've got juice. The controller is going through its diagnostics, and now you can hear that relay over there buzzing. We're at 115, 121, 127, 130, and already I'm seeing melting around the edges. And when this gets to 180, it should go into a maintenance mode where it just maintains the temperature. There we go. And it will sit there all day long, just like that, keeping this just at the molten point. And the smoke you saw earlier was just the flux burning off. I put a little bit of flux on top of the solder to keep it from oxidizing. And if you maintain it at this temperature, the flux won't burn off. It'll just keep the surface nice and, and uh, clean. And when you're ready to solder, I'm going to hit my turbo switch and boot this up to 200 degrees C. Right now I'm holding it up. And 89, there's 200 C. And right now it's ready to solder. And you can see the flux is beginning to smoke just a little bit. And every once in a while as I'm soldering, I can give it another shot and keep it up in the higher range. And then as I go about getting cables prepped and so on, it'll drop back down to the 180 degrees C and maintain it. Actually, it's 183 C is where the solder melts. I haven't calibrated the, uh, the thermocouple. Didn't bother. I knew it was close enough and it works. At 180 indicated, it goes molten. So there you have it. There's my... Uh, 40 second solder pot. We'll uh, find another contactor, find some way to enclose all of this nice and in a nice, neat, compact package at some point. But for now, I've proved out the control circuitry works. I have a better idea of what I'm going to need for a relay to control this thing. And we'll put this together. Sometime here in the not too distant future, I will do a video on prepping the cables, the way I prep my coax cables. There we go. We're coming down close. It's going to start trying to slow the fall down is what it's doing. It, it knows it's approaching the set point, and it's going to try to maintain it without falling under is what it's doing. And as it gets closer and closer to the correct point that time will drop off and it'll just maintain it right around the 180 degree C because that's what I have it programmed for and again it's actually around 183 C or the solder wouldn't be molten but the controller doesn't know that it just knows what it's reading back from the thermocouple and what I've set for a set point Hope this was informative. If you liked it, please give me a thumbs up. And not too far from now, we'll have the coaxial cable preparation. Thanks for stopping by. This is the Radio Mechanic. Oh, and for those who have stuck around, I thought maybe you'd want to see how quick I can bring this up to the actual soldering or work temperature I want. I just pushed my little thermal or my little uh, turbo switch over here. And you can see how quick that temperature is coming up. It doesn't take long. 195, 196, that's plenty hot enough now to start soldering. I could give another little shot if I wanted and put it at 200C. Do two or three, four joints, whatever I wanted. And then go back and prep more cables while the temperature falls back down to the maintenance point. See ya!